started. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the 71st QCAM webinar. We're really excited to have you join us today, and we are especially excited to have Matthew Chow giving us a talk about his work with nuclear electronic orbital methods in QCAM. So um, first, a little bit about Matthew. He received his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Pittsburgh in 2020, and he's currently pursuing a PhD in Professor Sharon Hanschipper's group at Yale. He has contributed to the development of multi-scale approaches like the um, PCM approach and hybrid quantum mechanical um, like QMMM approaches um, within the uh, nuclear electronic orbital or NEO framework, which is mostly what he'll, his talk will be focusing on today. And actually last year, he participated in our summer at QCAM internship program where he worked to implement NEO PCM. So right now his focus is on simulating couple cluster uh, or sorry, coupled nuclear electronic quantum dynamics in heterogeneous environments using Neo QMMM approaches. So before we get started, I do also want to note that if you have questions during the talk, to please post them in the Q&A section, which there should be a little button at the bottom for that um, on your screen, and we will answer them at the end of the talk. So thank you so much for your attention, and without further ado, let's go ahead and hand it over to Matthew. Here we go. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, thank you to Shannon for the uh, introduction and for organizing today's webinar. Um, today, I will be giving a very general overview of NEO methods that are currently available in QCHEM 6. Um, and as Shannon discussed, I'll be talking about some of the recent work that I've been doing in, in the Hamas Schiffer group. Um, so my involvement is in the development of NEO methods has been to couple this framework to various multi-scale approaches, um, such as PCM or, or QMMM, sort of uh, looking at explicit salvation. Um, and namely, I'm just trying to factor in these effects uh, into ways that we can use it to, uh, 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 to sort of couple studies with NEO into these sort of complex environments. Um, but uh, before, be before I begin, I wanted to provide a structure for today's webinar. So uh, I've sort of broken down my talk into three parts. So in the first part, I will briefly review what the NEO method is, uh, point out some new features and recent developments that are uh, currently available in the public release of, of QCAM 6 and up. Um, and also talk about some of the recent work that I've been invo involved in. Um, in the second part, I will briefly go over uh, sort of a very brief tutorial-like demonstration on how to actually set up and run a NEO calculation in the presence of implicit water solvent, so sort of a, a NEO PCM uh, a job calculation. Uh, and lastly, in the final part, I have just a brief slide outlining some of the new NEO methods that we are uh, currently working on um, or have worked on and which will eventually make its way into the public uh, version of QCAM. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention that previously in the group, uh, Dr. Coraline Tao had given an overview of NEO methods in, at the time, QCAM 5.3. Um, and today's webinar will be in some way sort of an extension of the methods that she had already been, uh, that she had already uh, discussed previously. So uh, Coraline had given an excellent talk and I encourage anyone uh, uh, currently attending this webinar who's interested uh, in NEO methods more generally to also go back and watch that seminar. Um, okay, so to give a little bit of sort of motivational background, um, I want to just point out that nuclear quantum effects and non-Born Oppenheimer effects play an essential role in many areas of, of chemistry and biology. Um, uh, you may have heard some of, of Sharon's talks before, but uh, you know, what we often say is sort of effects such as zero-point energy or hydrogen tunneling and kinetic isotope effects are important in, in sort of numerous applications. For example, um, if we want to study sort of the dynamical and static properties of water, if we want to perhaps model hydrogen bonding interactions more, more accurately, or maybe this, we wanted to describe, say, proton transfer or proton couple electron transfer PCET processes, um, and even something even more ambitious, if we wanted to start probing biology uh, relevant enzyme catalysis, all of these uh, oftentimes require us to have a clear understanding as to how nuclear, including nuclear quantum effects, inherently can affect some of the measurable properties that we wish to obtain. And all of this is motivation for the NEO method, which is uh, one approach for including nuclear quantum effects and non Bohr Oppenheimer effects into quantum chemistry calculations and molecular dynamics. So the NEO method is just one such approach, um, but it can sort of allow us to, or we can start uh, begin looking at a wide range of systems where nuclear quantum effects can potentially play a, a substantial role. Um, so just to briefly re review uh, what the NEO method is more generally, um, 
The nuclear electronic orbit or NEO method is an approach where specified nuclei are treated quantum mechanically on the same level as electrons. Uh, and, I, and the idea here is that we want to solve a mixed nuclear electronic Schrodinger equation using either DFT or wave function-based wave function approaches, and both have been already developed within the group. Um, these quantum nuclei are often chosen to be protons, uh, or sometimes often hydrogen isotopes such as deuterium can be used to study um, sort of kind of isotope effects as well. Um, but protons are usually chosen just because their, their masses are often, uh, well, the, the, pro the proton mass is very light, uh, and therefore... Um, Treating those uh, protons quantized, it allows us, well, they, they exhibit sort of pronounced nuclear quantum effects and non-Born-Oppenheimer behavior. So it makes sense to just treat those, those nuclei quantum as opposed to all, all the all the class, all the nuclei in your system. Um, and I've sort of employed color coding to better illustrate how NEO might differ from, or how NEO differs from conventional electronic methods. And so here on the on the top right, uh, this is just an ethane molecule uh, where illustrated in purple mesh are just the quantum proton molecular orbitals for all the five for all the six protons being treated quantum mechanically. Um, and in terms of how this might look like comparing to conventional methods, well, first we have to introduce what the Neo Hamiltonian looks like. So the Neo Hamiltonian has these standard terms for the electrons, um, sort of here color coded in red. Um, uh, the standard terms for the electrons includes the kinetic energy of the electrons, electron-electron repulsion, and the interaction of the electrons with the classical nuclei. And we, we already know this. Um, but then on top of that, you have the analogous terms in purple. Uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the kinetic energy of the protons, and now we have proton-proton uh, repulsion, and now it's a repulsive interaction between our protons with the classical nuclei. And finally, we have an extra term here in blue, which is the attractive electron-proton interaction. Uh, and the idea here is that you solve, you can either solve time-dependent or time-independent Schrodinger equation. Um, but now the wave function, because we've in, because we've sort of uh, quantized these protons to the same level as, as the electrons, um, uh, uh, your wave function depends explicitly not only on the coordinates of the electrons, but also on the quantum protons. And the resulting electron proton vibronic a potential energy surface depends only on the geometries of the classical nuclei. So neo hartree fock um, is the simplest neo wave function variant, and the wave function ansatz expresses a total wave function as a product of uh, electronic and protonic slated determinants. And each of these slated determinants are comprised of molecular orbitals that are linear combination of, of electronic and protonic Gaussian basis functions, uh, which are uh, analog. So we have an uh, analogous set of uh, protonic basis functions in addition to the standard ones you use for the electro uh, electronic basis functions. Um, and just like conventional electronic approaches, the target is to minimize the overall system energy by optimizing the linear, linear combination of the Gaussian, of, of the coefficients of the Gaussian basis functions. Um, and this is done by solving the neo hartree rotan equations, which are actually coupled together through these electron-proton-coulomb terms in blue. So that's just sort of an introduction about, about NEO. And I just want to preface by saying that many wave function based approaches sort of using hartree fock neo hartree fock as its starting point have actually already been developed and extended to NEO, including NEO couple cluster, which is actually available in QCAM6 and developed by a uh, 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 former postdoc in the group, uh, Dr. Fabian Pavosevich, um, among others that are currently uh, in the group and in, in developing this front, including uh, work done by Jonathan, uh, Dr. Jonathan Featheroff, who has been working on neocouple cluster as well as MP2 methods for NEO, and Dr. Uh, Chris Malbon, who has been working on sort of developing uh, multi-reference methods for, for, the, for the NEO framework. Um, but at least for today's talk, I'll be discussing, uh, um, I'll be fo sort of focusing more on the sol solvation aspect and sort of time-dependent dynamics of NEO, which are often done with NEO DFT just because it's it's more computationally accessible. And so my focus for today's talk would sort of be related just, just on NEO DFT. Uh, so neo DFT is a multi-component density functional theory approach, which means that which means that it's a, a generalization of the conventional DFT approach to multiple types of quantum part quantum particles. So uh, compared to sort of the conventional electronic DFT picture, the analogous cone sham formalism for multi-component systems now now depends on both the electronic and protonic density, so rho e and rho p, uh, and it can be shown that this gives rise to a total energy functional. That can actually be, that can actually be broken down into the following individual components. 
this first term here in black is the uh, external sort of external energy energy functional, which represents the interaction of the electrons and quantum protons with the field of classical nuclei. The second term in black is the reference energy, and this includes the non-interacting kinetic energy of, of the electrons and quantum protons, as well as all the Coulomb interactions between pairs of electrons and electrons, protons, protons, and electron protons. And finally, sort of the, the meat of, of DFT, so to speak, are these terms, uh, uh, these last three terms here in, in uh, shaded in this various different colors. Um, and these sort of three, three uh, functionals encompass uh, the many body interactions. So the term in red is the electronic exchange correlation energy. And this is no different from the functionals that one normally uses for conventional electronic DFT, such as B3LIP or PBE type functionals. Next in purple, we have the proton-proton exchange correlation energy. Uh, in, in practice, the proton-proton correlation is actually quite small since the proton molecular orbitals are actually relatively localized. So uh, for convenience, um, the, these are often typically neglected, although the proton-proton exchange terms from, from Neo-Hartree-Fock are so retained in order to avoid self-interaction error. But that's sort of a more of a, a technical aspect of, of including uh, this exchange correlation functional. And the sort of... Um, Really interesting part here is the term in blue, and this is the electron-proton correlation energy term. Um, and I just want to say that the uh, there's been a series of electron-proton or EPC functionals that have already been developed in the group, namely by uh, Yang Yang and also Coraline uh, Coraline Tao, um, who've, who's developed sort of a series of, of functionals over the years, and which are also available uh, for for use in QChem. Um, but to this last point, I just want to stress that the, the, well, yes, the benefit of NEO-DFT approach with EPC functionals cannot be stressed enough. And I just wanted to uh, sort of drive that point home by first showing you this uh, slice of the proton density in the bottom on the bottom left-hand corner. So what we're looking at is just a one-dimensional slice of the quantum proton density, rho p, along the on-axis plane um, of this FHF minus molecule. So in FHF, we have this internal proton that is being treated quantum mechanically with NEO-DFT. And in this sort of plot here, um, shown in red is a NEO-DFT uh, uh, Neo uh, result without EPC. And in blue is the NEO, is the density slice uh, with NEO-DFT with EPC functional. And the specific EPC functional used here is, is EPC-17-2, as I mentioned before, was developed by um, uh, uh, Dr. Yang Yang, who was previously in the group. And finally, in the black is a grid-based reference result obtained from solving the three-dimensional uh, three dimensional Schrodinger equation at every point in a three-dimensional grid that sort of spans the region of your proton density. And at least for the electronic adiabatic system studied, this grid result we consider it to be numerically exact uh, proton densities. Um, we see that without uh, electron-proton correlation, uh, which is the plot here in red, you get very localized proton densities. And it turns out if you were to create the same plot with neo hartree fock uh, you also get a very similar result. And in particular, you can see how the, the tails of the density in red are more, localized, are more localized along this sort of molecular axis. So it's sort of less stretched out. Um, and it turns out this very localized proton density is not qualitatively accurate. And therefore it's not very useful if you're willing to describe properties that rely on, on proton densities. On the other hand, in blue, um, we show what happens when you do include EPC functional, uh, and that matches actually quite quite well the reference curve shown in here in black. Um, so I, I've spoken a lot about proton densities, but you know, on the other hand, we can also use Neo DFT to look at some actually interesting um, uh, chemical properties for us to compare to experiment. So on the right, on the lower right hand corner, um, I'm showing the uh, overall mean onset error of uh, the proton affinities for a diverse test set of molecules that are then compared relative to uh, what they are experimentally. Uh, you can see that the inclusion of e a Neo DFT with EPC, we get uh, much better agreement with experiment almost on the chemical accuracy um, as opposed to not including uh, EPC. So the idea is, I guess the overall take home message of the slide is that Neo e DFT with EPC is actually able to, de to describe the impact of nuclear quantum effects, such as proton delocalization, and also includes the anharmonic zero-point uh, vibrational zero-point energy of the proton, uh, which 
contributes to why we have much better agreement with the experiment. And a lot of this work in implementing Neo DFT, uh, Neo DFT into QCAM has actually been done already by, by uh, Coraline uh, before, but I guess what's new for QCAM 6 is that now in addition to analytical gradients, we also have analytical Hessians, which are now supported. Uh, sort of moving beyond the ground state, uh, Coraline has also worked on Neo DFT for excited states through the Neo TDDFT uh, linear response formalism. So Neo TDDFT is based on a linear response of the Neo Conchian system to, to perturbative external fields. Um, and what's important from Neo TD, TDDFT is that we can obtain both electron, uh, electron and proton single excitations as well as mixed electron proton character excitations. Um, and it's been found also in, in some of the published work that Neo D TDDFT can give quite accurate fundamental protonic vibration frequencies. And in terms of what's new for QCAM6 um, is that the protonic uh, transition dipole moments or uh, the protonic, uh, protonic transition densities as well as the, the transition dipole moments can actually be extracted and also opened up into IQ mode to actually allow the user to characterize each of the vibrational modes. So shown here, it's just an example, is a, is a Zundel H5025 plus species where all five protons were treated quantum mechanically um, with, with Neo TDDFT. And shown at least for the uh, uh, lowest lying excitation, um, I'm plotting the transition densities for uh, for the quantum protons, and you can sort of characterize this as being one of the uh, the hydrogen sort of bending modes. So that's just one of the features that you can do now in QCAM six that previously uh, was only in the developer version of QCAM. Um, and lastly, I guess something related that I quickly wanted to discuss is a Neo SCFV procedure. So in the previous slide, I've shown that with Neo we can obtain vibrational the vibrational motion of the quantum protons with for example, the the uh, neo t uh, the new response to DFT formalism. Um, but the idea behind neo SCFV is that it's a procedure that actually allows us to couple those vibrations to uh, the other classical nuclear modes, and it works by uh, taking information from the the neo DFT analytical Hessian, as well as the uh, excited vibrational states from neo t to DFT to obtain the full three n or the three n minus five or three n minus six molecular vibration of frequencies. Uh, the Neo SCFV procedure um, has been implemented in QCAM six by uh, Dr. Patrick Schneider and and Dr. Coraline Tao, uh, and this method has been used to incorporate or has been shown it can incorporate significant anharmonic effects associated with the quantum protons into molecular vibration of frequencies. Um, in, in published work, we've, show, we, we've shown that this approach agrees well with experiment, experimental data. Um, on the right is just a sample output file. Um, if you were to run a Neo hartree fock V calculation in QCAM6, um, taken just from, from the end of the output, you can see that for this HCN molecule, where uh, we have one proton uh, quantized, uh, we actually obtain all, all, all four of the Neo coupled vibrations. So we have two of the degenerate CH bending modes, um, along with a CN, CN stretch, and as well as a CH stretch. So again, this is one of the features that, that you could use in QCAM6 that previously was only in, in, in the development version of, of QCAM5. So I've talked about sort of a little bit of what's new or what the user can expect has changed from QCAM5 and going into QCAM6. And now I want to talk a little bit in terms of um, more recent work in NEO um, and specifically, that's through the lens of, a, of the real-time NEO approach. So the real-time NEO uh, TDDFT, or for brevity, we just call it the real-time NEO approach. Um, the idea is that the NEO wave function, which I showed earlier, um, which is a single slightly determined product of electrons and protons, uh, we substitute this wave function into the time-dependent Schrodinger equation um, to yield a set of multi-component von Neumann equations shown here on the bottom. Um, this is exactly analogous to conventional electronic real-time TDDFT methods, but now we end up having two sets of equations, one for the electrons, as well as one for the protons. And these are all time independent in which we can then propagate them numerically. Um, from the real-time NEO approach, um, we can propagate these equations and from the resulting trajectories, um, it can be analyzed to give both electronic and vibrational spectra and although it's not shown here, we've shown that uh, in previous work that it's, it agrees well with the linear response uh, Neo TDFT results that I uh, spoke about previously. Um, 
so that's all great so, you know, for, for posterity and it agrees with linear response. But I guess one of the key, uh, or I guess one of the certain advantages of why we're interested in real-time NEO is not just because it can give us similar results or matching vibrational spectra as linear response, but it actually allows us to perform non-equilibrium, non born up and hybrid nuclear electronic dynamics. Um, in terms of the theoretical underpinnings behind real-time NEO methods and sort of the applications related to, to real-time NEO, um, we've been working in collaboration with Professor Shaosong Lee's group from the University of Washington. Um, and in one of these collaborative works with, with, with Shao Song's group, um, the real-time NEO method was actually used to study a photo-induced proton transfer reaction in what we call this OHB molecule. Um, I forget what the full name of the molecule is, but for sure we often, by, for convenience, call OHBA. Um, regardless, in the study, uh, the idea is that we can photo-excite uh, OHBA to an excited electronic state by promoting a single electron from the highest occupied molecular orbital to the uh, lowest uh, unoccupied molecular orbital. And by integrating the nuclear electronic dynamics uh, uh, through these couple of unknown equations, we can actually observe proton transfer. And we've compared that to the case where uh, if this transfer proton were treated classically. So in this plot here on the bottom left, uh, what we're looking at is just the uh, uh, OH distances where we're measuring the distance between the uh, proton position expectation value. Uh, remember, so the proton is actually quantized. So a more rigorous approach would be sort of to to um, to uh, show this as being sort of a delocalized uh, proton uh, density distribution. But here we're just saying we're taking the expectation value of where the proton would be. Uh, and what the distance between that is from either the donor or the acceptor oxygen, so OD or OA. Uh, we can see that um, we can see that uh, here the protons actually moving uh, towards the acceptor and away from the donor or oxygen, and the crossing point in this in these two curves is where the OH distances are the same, in which this is what we define as to be the proton transfer uh, time. So this is just sort of a, a sort of a, a um, um, foundational and sort of a, a proof of concept as to how you might want to use real time neo to study sort of photo excited uh, processes or proton transfer. Uh, extending from this theoretical foundation, um, postdoc and Sharon's group, Dr. Tao Li, has actually implemented real time neo into QChem, and he's actually used it to study various applications and extensions of this method. So. Uh, I would just sort of give a highlight of some of uh, Tao's work. And if you're interested, I've listed down sort of his references here for you for you to uh, read on your own time. But on the right, um, Tao has actually coupled real-time NEO TDF, TDDFT to a cavity motor photon um, in this application to molecular parallel terms. So not only is he propagating the electrons and protons according to the equations I showed in the previous slide, but as well as also the, 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 the classical photons. Um, in principle, you could also, uh, th these protons could also be uh, treated quantum mechanically, but I think that's something that uh, is, is currently still in the works. And here on the left um, uh, uh, is an application of real-time NEO and applying it to plasmonic systems and seeing how it can model sort of H2 dissociation at an aluminum cluster. So these are sort of uh, starting to get exciting where, where, where we can start to use NEO methods to look at very uh, more interesting systems in which, you know, I think uh, we're getting to the point now where it's, uh, uh, Neo is really showing its its importance to the world and why why this is something that we're, um, we're, we're all constantly developing. Um, and on the bottom here, uh, it's an uh, additional extension to real-time Neo. So the real-time Neo by itself um, can, uh, well, it, the real-time NEO approach considers all the other nuclei fixed. So I should have pointed that out before. All the other nu all the other classical nuclei are fixed, um, but uh, we can actually allow those uh, particles to move as well by combining real-time NEO with Aaron Feist dynamics. And that's what's been done here uh, with our collaboration with Xiao Song. And again, Tao has also implemented this in into a version of QCAN. So by by coupling the uh, classical system via Anifres, uh, 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 via the Anifres approach to this sort of uh, quantum subsystem, we can not only describe the the motion, the I guess the dynamics of the uh, uh, the quantum subsystem, but also describe the motion of the classical nuclei on that instantaneous electron-proton vibronic surface. 
um, just by uh, following Newton's equation of motion by numer and, and numerically integrating the quantum subsystem, which is electrons and protons, we have a way of performing non-equilibrium nuclear electronic dynamics. So this is just a summary in terms of what we've done so far in terms of really extending real-time NEO. Uh, just changing gears slightly again, I want to talk now a little bit about um, my involvement in NEO. Uh, and that has largely been the extension of ne current existing NEO methods and how to factor in the effects of an external environment. Um, by external environment, we're mostly at this point concerned about uh, solvation. So there's largely two ways to uh, factor in the effects of a solvent environment. One is through implicit solvation models or more commonly, uh, or I guess one of the more common approaches is, is PCM. Um, so. Just a little uh, picture just to sort of motivate this discussion going forward. Um, and the other approach is to model a solvent uh, explicitly explicitly using a QMMM approach. So uh, these, uh, this is just an atomistic, atomistic representation of, of, uh, of, say, water molecules around this solid molecule of interest. Um, and this really comes down to how the solvent environment is able to polarize the electron and proton densities and in some cases also back polarize uh, the, sol the the solvent uh, degrees of freedom itself. So in terms of sort of the, the first sort of uh, uh, approach or one of the approaches for modeling solvent is, as I mentioned, uh, PCM. So in continuum solvation, PCM is one of the most widely used models. Um, and I also encourage anyone here who hasn't seen it already, um, Professor John Herbert, who has been instrumental in developing the, the continuum solvent models uh, in QChem, to also give his webinar a talk, which largely I've been able to extend and learn as well um, how, to, uh, how to implement, or I guess how to adapt PCM to function with, with NEO. So just to give a quick summary, in PCM, a solute molecule is embedded in a cavity, uh, oftentimes a molecular-shaped cavity, but that doesn't have to be. Um, and the solvent is described using a uniform continuum whose polarization, whose polarization response is governed by a uh, dielectric constant that's characteristic of the bulk solvent that you're that you're uh, wishing to model. So, for example, water, you maybe use a dielectric constant around seventy eight or eighty. Um, and PCM models are actually great because it allows us to build in solvent effects directly into a QM calculation without having to do additional sort of configurational sampling of the surrounding waters. And all around, it's it's generally more efficient um, uh, approach. Um, I really won't get into it in this in in this talk since it's not really uh, I guess the focus. But um, PCM is formally an electrostatics only approach, so stuff sort of um, sort of like close range uh, uh, interactions. Um, uh, energetics are involved in let's say uh, creating the cavity, such as cavitation as well as things such as like hydrogen bonding, all these other energetic terms, these are not included uh, into a PCM calculation, although there are, have been ways sort of to add in sort of quote unquote, non-electrostatic interactions back into your total energy. Um, in addition to that, there's also some additional practical considerations when you're doing a PCM calculation, that is, how do you construct your cavity? As I mentioned before, usually people often choose a molecular shaped cavity and scale it by some certain, uh, uh, let's say, scaling parameter uh, because it, they found that it matches well with experimental results. Um, and there's also many, many different flavors of PCM, such as uh, a conductor like PCM, the more exact IF PCM approach, uh, and many others, which uh, I won't get into, but are certainly something that you can uh, read into, I think. John Herbert has a uh, very, uh, very detailed and very well-written uh, 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 review talking about these different approaches. Um, and lastly, uh, how do you sort of define what the surface charge is? So um, in PCM, you construct your cavity, but this cavity is actually discretized into many, many fine points or tesserae um, that are, uh, are solved uh, for all intents and purposes on, on, on a grid. Um, and depending on how you how you um, define what how those charges look like, whether they be point charges or they have some sort of Gaussian uh, uh, weight associated to them, it can largely affect some of the the results that you obtain. And that's something that I'll just show very briefly in the next slide. Um, and lastly, uh, this equation in the bottom here, 
um, just to give you an idea of, in terms of how PCM might work. So this is the discretized form of Poisson's equation where um, if you know the electrostatic potential that's generated from your solid molecule, you can identify what the uh, resulting polarization set of polarization charges would be at the surface of your cavity. And this is something that you'd factor in when you're calculating, say, for example, salvation free energies or how do you inf how do you sort of polarize your your, your wave function. So um, I've, uh, as Shannon mentioned uh, in the introduction, uh, last summer at QCHEM, I was able to uh, adapt, uh, uh, I guess, uh, the PCM approaches to function as well with the NEO approaches. Um, so currently in QCHEM 6, we have both uh, a NEO PCM, NEO DFT PCM and Hartree-Fock energies and gradients. Um, in terms of what how as conventional approaches and neo approaches differ in terms of PCM treatment. Um, fundamentally, uh, uh, what differs is that in neo you have additional terms to deal with the additional quantum proton interactions. So you have an additional uh, uh, term in terms of describing electrostatic potential in terms of a, a delocalized uh, proton density, as well as how the charges then mutually affect your your, your system. Um, and on this bottom left uh, corner here, this is just a plot of the uh, number of optimization steps until we're sufficiently converged for a neo PCM geometry optimization in 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 implicit water. Um, so uh, in this system here, we have a cluster of waters where all the protons are treated quantum mechanically. And um, by optimizing this in implicit solvation using two different discretization schemes, uh, variable test rate number or VPN or SWIG, which is actually um, a discretization scheme developed by Professor John Herbert, we see that uh, with the SWIG approach, we can get smoother convergence. And um, this is something that um, that uh, was not too surprising uh, for us for the same reasons that uh, Professor Herbert uh, discussed in his talk um, with the point charges representation, oftentimes you'd run into sort of this, this continuity is in your potential energy landscape as you're optimizing, because the idea is that the cavity uh, changes as you're optimizing the geometry. And that's just something that uh, it's it's nice to have in QCHEM in which uh, we're now able to do. Um, and just to give a, a very uh, a perfunctory discussion, uh, the other way to model in the effects of a solvent is through uh, hybrid QMMM approaches. So, um, I'm sure many people are familiar with QMMM, but the idea is that um, you have uh, a region that is treated at a lower level of theory, usually using some classical force field. Um, this is, for example, like um, you can have explicit water mo model by TIP3P or SPC waters. Um, and these uh, uh, waters follow a, a classical force field uh, potential and the QM region that you're really interested in studying that could be a, say, it's as simple as a, a as a phenol molecule or something, let's say, um, a region of interest in a larger enzyme. That's something that you can treat using a specified QM level theory. Um, and the interactions between those two environments are handled in several diff different ways, whether it's sort of electrostatic embedding or uh, something that's maybe uh, uh, currently of interest now, sort of polarizable uh, based em embedding approaches. And there's all different ways of, of uh, factoring in those two interactions, but such, such as uh, attractive or subtractive schemes. But again, for this talk, I won't really get into it, other than to say that um, I think in, in how most frameworks work for coupling uh, QM packages, such as QCAM, as well as to sort of uh, external uh, MD packages or, or MM, uh, MM packages, um, is to separate out your, your uh, energetic terms. So here in green, these are terms, which I'm just gonna co uh, colloquially call the QM level. These are terms that uh, can be calculated within QCAM. Um, and the term and the terms highlighted in red, these are terms that can be evaluated using an external uh, MD driver. And uh, I'll discuss later on, but we have a way of sort of meshing two together to allow us to, um, to operate in this framework. Um, and uh, as a natural extension, we've applied NEO on top of that. Um, for simplicity, we've we've done, or I guess we're, we've sort of implemented the NEO-Q memo with the electrostatic embedding approach, um, since that seems to be the most common approach. Um, uh, we have both energies and analytical gradients implemented in NEO-Q uh, NEO, uh, for NEO-Q memo. 
that is currently in a developer version of QCAM, but uh, we soon hope to bring it into the uh, release version of QCAM uh, later on this year. Um, and just sort of a uh, very uh, first principles a, a application of NeoCAM MM, uh, with these gradients, we've been able to perform sort of geometry optimizations in explicit solvent. Um, so here's just sort of an example of what we looked at, uh, where we've used uh, the infrastructure for NeoPCM and NeoCAM MM to uh, perform geometry optimizations for these three small organic molecules that are hydrogen bonded to just a single water molecule. Um, so uh, in this study, basically we took uh, this phenol species, metazole species and phenol that is hydrogen bonded to just a single water molecule. And we treated three uh, protons quantum mechanically. Here, show, the proton densities are actually shown here in, in purple mesh. Uh, and we optimize these geometries in vacuum using NeoDFT, as well as in PCM and explicit solvent, uh, which are shown in this table below. Um, and in in all these results, we find that the uh, the distances the distances here shown in this uh, sort of green arrow uh, actually get smaller uh, when you uh, perform these solution phase jump from optimizations. And at least for these systems here, it's telling us um, that um, perhaps we might see uh, I guess a stronger hydrogen bonding interaction with these uh, shorter. Uh, 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 distances at the, at the hydrogen bonding interface, but I guess more importantly, it's just to show that solvent does can play a role in the uh, geometries of these species. But we really want to go beyond just looking at jump from optimization. Actually, maybe uh, something that is uh, potentially more exciting and something that we uh, uh, currently uh, are still developing um, is to be able to actually do dynamics in in the condensed phase. So um, we we have done uh, sort of uh, dynamic simulations in PCM, um, but what the focus I wanted to bring for today's talk is actually how to do it in, in QMMM uh, environments. And largely because I think QMMM really opens the doors for us to model stuff beyond just explicit salvation, but also maybe interesting uh, systems such as a let's say a, a membrane or or enzyme or something a little bit more uh, something that might might allow us to study sort of more biology biologically oriented applications. So um, as I mentioned before, Tao has implemented the real time neo approach in a development version of QCAM. and uh, what we've done together is we've actually combined the infrastructure from his uh, his development, I guess, my work in QMMM, and we've been able to do sort of uh, full nuclear electronic uh, quantum dynamics in the condensed phase. So uh, in this work that Tao and I have recently submitted, uh, we were able to actually perform the sort of uh, simulation of a uh, QMM phenol embedded within an enzyme. And uh, we treat, this is for a phenol, we treat the proton for this hydroxyl group quantum mechanically. And this is something that uh, uh, is, I guess, opens the door for us to explore more, more interesting work. But for now, we were just uh, seeing what the behavior would be like if you were to just perform this uh, short simulation in an enzyme. Uh, maybe instead of sort of spinning my wheels a little bit, here's just an example in terms of how we've actually performed neo QMMM molecular dynamics. In these two movies, I'm showing a uh, phenol in explicit water where we're treating, again, the hydroxyl proton as, as quantized with using NeoDFT. Um, for convenience, these movies are actually illustrating the, the quantum proton uh, position expectation value. So if you just focus my laser pointer, uh, uh, these, these guys here, um, but we really know it's actually the localized density distribution. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the movie here, I can initiate this. So if you focus on, at least in the movie on the left, um, it's showing what happens when you do Born-Oppenheimer MD uh, with NeoDFT. So in this NeoBOMD trajectory, the classical nuclei that includes um, the phenol as well as explicit waters, move on the electron proton vibronic ground state that's generated on the fly with NeoDFT. What happens in this case, if you look at where my cursor is, is that the, uh, the the protons and electrons respond instantaneously to the classical nuclei, and you end up quenching out the proton vibrations. You see how uh, it's as if uh, it kind of looks like a sort of a, a rigid bond, but uh, you quench out all the 
all the vibrations for associated with the quantum proton and which we actually um, better illustrate in this plot here below. So shown in a solid blue line, you can see it is the uh, uh, plotting is the OH covalent bond distance of this hydroxyl group with the phenol. And you can see that we completely suppress all the natural uh, oscillations that you normally would find. And, and we know that protons really shouldn't be responding instantaneously as such. And therefore, a, perhaps a better approach for doing neo uh, QMM dynamics is to propagate the non equilibrium proton density according to the real time neo Ehrenfest approach, which I discussed previously. Um, and that behavior is shown on the movie here on the right. Um, this movie shows the real time propagation of the proton density uh, and how it's important for us to have an accurate description of the dynamics within within the neo framework. Um, we can see from this dashed green line here, here, here in the bottom, we can actually rec recover those OH oscillations. So the, the, the bottom line, I guess, the take home summary for this slide um, is that the real time neo Ehrenfest approach with QMEM is certainly a, a way for us to propagate nuclear uh, non equilibrium proton densities together with the dynamics of a complex environment, such as in this case, explicit solvent or uh, in the paper. Uh, an enzyme system, and this really opens up a lot of uh, possibilities for uh, for us in terms of what we can uh, uh, do in these kinds of environments. Um, just an, an additional application of that, um, we've also performed an excited state and trinolactic proton transfer in OHBA in the explicit solvent. Uh, showing here is that the rate of proton transfer uh, can be uh, affected by the presence of solvent. So again, we photo excite this molecule, and we uh, 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 we uh, propagate the dynamics of electrons and protons, and we uh, we measure the the OH uh, distances as a function of time. And uh, here we're just comparing two different results that we get when running the simulation in solvent and vacuum. And you can see solvent can certainly play a, a role in 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 sort of these proton transfer processes. And uh, similarly, we applied the real-time neo interface QMM approach to look at uh, ground state proton transfer in male aldehyde. So the idea here is that we're starting in this sort of uh, a symmetric geometry, which uh, we've shown previously, allows us to observe proton transfer within, let's say, first uh, 100, fem 100 femtoseconds of the simulation. Um, and what we did was we just equilibrated three different solvent configurations around this sort of fixed geometry, um, just to allow us to see what the uh, measurable impact of having explicit solvent would be to the system. Um, and in these configurations, A, B, C, uh, we see that in some cases, uh, with the inclusion of sol explicit solvent, proton transfer is actually suppressed, whereas in some cases, um, in, uh, so, so solvent is shown in green, uh, in some cases, proton transfer is actually uh, uh, decelerated, and in other cases, it can be accelerated. Um, and lastly, this uh, we did the exact same simulation as shown in the previous slide. But instead of uh, treating the proton quantum mechanically, we just propagate it using just conventional born up and hammer molecular dynamics. So uh, for intensive purposes, the, the 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 proton here is treated classically, and you can see here that in all cases we observe no proton transfer. Uh, and this is this comparing this this slide and the last slide is just an example as to um, uh, how important it is to propagate the. And not only the, the electrons and pro, uh, not only the electrons, but as well also the protons, and having this sort of uh, uh, not no born oppenheimer separation between them allows you to study these kind of processes because clearly with just propagating electronic dynamics, we actually don't see proton transfer. So uh, you can really see that the importance of this sort of uh, 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 mixed uh, electron proton behavior allows us to see this sort of interesting, um, interesting phenomenon. Uh, just sort of wrapping up things here a little bit, I just want to mention that all this work in terms of neo QMM is all made possible uh, thanks to the uh, the Gromax uh, and QCAM interface uh, written by Dr. Valko for Shabika and Dr. Uh, Max Banger, who previously had given a, a QCAM webinar um, uh, uh, discussing their interface and how uh, others can adapt it. So um, uh, this is something that we are uh, hoping to eventually um, also bring forward in terms of um, uh, bring forward to something that, that the general user can use, not just in developer version of QCAM. Um, but as I currently stand, this is a really nice a nice way for us to uh, pursue these type of applications. Um, just a quick summary slide in terms of, since I'm running out of time here, I guess current Neo features in QCAM 
So uh, prior to uh, QCAM6, um, we've uh, there, there was a neo hartree fock or Neo-DFT analytical gradient, which uh, again allows you to do sort of geometry optimizations, but you have the gradients. Um, we've also had a neo td hartree fock and TD-DFT already implemented in QCAM. But what's new for QCAM6 is Coreline has allowed uh, has extended some of the uh, additional features, such as uh, 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 allowing you to visualize the uh, transition state densities as well as print out the oscillator strengths, um, and just a more useful tool that the user might find uh, to be helpful for them to use this feature. I've also mentioned um, the addition of new SCIV procedures in QCAM6. Uh, something I didn't mention, like Coreline has also developed analytical gradients for td hard fock and TDDFT, which you can read more about in the manual. Um, I've ap added the, the NEO um, sort of PCM treatment uh, last summer uh, when I was at QCHEM. Um, and Dr. Fabian Popovic have has also implemented NEO couple cluster methods uh, into QCHEM, which uh, you can again read more about there. But um, before I close off sort of the, this webinar, um, I just wanted to sort of give uh, a, a practical uh, demonstration in terms of how you would actually run a, a neo PCM calculation, um, and I think a lot of this is self-explanatory, and I think we've done a a, a great detailed job uh, discussing this in in the manual. But I think sometimes it's helpful to actually walk through how you would actually set up the calculation. So um, I took an example here where uh, I just have a phenol molecule, hydrogen bond with this water, uh, and that's embedded in in implicit water. Uh, and these dots, these are just so the fine, the, the little tessera that you get from discretizing your cavity surface. Um, as you would any other QCAM calculation, you specify your, your, your molecular geometry. Um, the important part about NEO is that um, the uh, uh, the index, I guess the index or the ordering of your, um, of the molecular coordinates are important because the index number corresponds to the proton basis function center that uh, for the species that you'll be treating quantum mechanically. So in this case, we must remember that when we put this, uh, when we write our molecule input section, our indices number is 13, 15, and 16. These correspond to the proton basis function centers for these species here where my cursor is. And this is important because when we specify our, our neo basis, again, we expand our molecular overalls in terms of, uh, of uh, Gaussian basis sets. Um, you provide the same index numbers here. So here I'm just showing index 13, but you would do the same for the other two basis function centers. Um, uh, previously, uh, Dr. Chi Yu in the group has developed a set of, of Gaussian basis functions for, for uh, that can be used for neo calculations, which you can, um, which when you're running a neo calculation, you should always refer back to just to make sure you have the right exponents. Um, but basically you have to specify this every time you run a neo calculation. Um, and it's likely that in the future, we would change a little bit of sort of the formatting in terms of how you would uh, set this up. We might have sort of symbolic basis sets, but at this current time, this is how you would define the basis. Um, and then you just define your general run variables. So uh, these are just sort of variables that um, I've used for my calculation, but um, I think for, for the uh, user of QCAM, these are quite familiar, sort of sets the global variables for, for, Neo, for, for, for jobs in QCAM. Um, and for the neo specific ones, the idea is that we have to toggle neo equals true, and all the keywords below that uh, only work once uh, with neo obviously equals equals true. So these are things that the user can have fine tuning of, and which again it can be found in the in the user manual. Um, and at least for the solvent specific aspect of it, uh, I've largely adapted the infrastructure um, for just conventional PCM calculations and extended to work for NEO. So keywords such as solvent, PC, solvent method equals PCM also allows you to access NEO PCM calculations as well as defining the PCM input section and solvent uh, section. So a lot of the features that you could use for conventional PCM have now been extended to the NEO, including the different types of discretization, as well as different types of PCM theory. Uh, and this is just the output that you get after running this Neo PCM uh, uh, geometry optimization. Um, as you would for any uh, QCAM geometry optimization, at the end, you get your converged geometry. Just a little caveat in Neo calculations is that uh, the, uh, the geometry that you get for the uh, uh, indices that you specified previously, these are actually the quantum proton basis function center positions. 
So if a user would like to uh, understand what or get at what the what the actual geometry is, they actually have to look further down below, where we actually give you we actually compute it what the uh, position expectation value is for each of those uh, three protons above. So that, that's just something that uh, perhaps um, is is worth mentioning for anyone who's who's interested in running an optimiz uh, neo optimization more generally in in QCAM. Lastly, um, this is just a slide in terms of what we are currently working on and stuff that we're hoping to push forward to QCAM Trunk later on this year. Uh, Tao and I, we've been working on uh, uh, putting real-time NEO uh, tethered with QMMM together. Um, and this is something that uh, we're gonna hope to push before the end of the year. Um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, Jonathan and Chris are working on uh, sort of NEO wave function methods. And those are currently also in development. Uh, and Dr. Chi, uh, and Chi and Joe in the group have been working on uh, uh, additional multi-reference method called, called Neo Multisite DFT. Uh, and this is a way for them to look at sort of hydrogen tunneling with Neo and also uh, uh, start to maybe look at some interesting dynamics. And lastly, uh, another feature that we're hoping to push is this constrained Neo approach, which is uh, developed by uh, Professor Yang Yang, um, but implemented in the group by uh, by Dr. Eno uh, Penier, who's, uh, who's actually done this already in the developer version of QCAM. But um, I think a lot of this is, is still, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of not a pipe dream, but it will certainly come forward, uh, hopefully hopefully soon. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that gives an overview in terms of what we're currently working on. Um, in terms of just acknowledgements, first, I would like to close off today's webinar by, by acknowledging my research advisor, Professor Sharon Hamas Schiffer, as well as current members of the group who are working on the development of NEO methods. Um, and all of this development is made possible thanks to QCAM, and I would like to thank the whole QCAM team um, for uh, organizing today's talk, as well as uh, allowing me to spend last, uh, last summer in, in Pleasanton to, to help uh, spearhead some of these developments. Um, so with that, I think um, I would hand it, pass it back off to Sh uh, Shannon, and I guess I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions afterwards. That was a really phenomenal talk. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I guess I'll check the Q&A section first to see, it looks like there's a couple of questions in here um, that folks have already asked. Um, just a reminder that the Q&A section is down there if um, anyone wants to ask questions. Uh, the first question that we have, um, which I believe was asked fairly early on in the talk was, what causes uh, neo hartree fock to highly localize pro proton densities? And does the tendency for DFT to artificially over delocalize electron densities apply to protons too? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I think maybe I can probably go back to that slide. Um, so this is just a, 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 a question about neo DFT in general. So the idea behind neo uh, having giving you overly localized proton densities uh, is sort of related to the uh, same idea of having neo DFT without electron proton correlation. So it turns out that in order to actually um, have qualitatively good behavior, it, it really is important to have a really good uh, EPC functional. So um, it's not something I, I guess really uh, intrinsically wrong with the method. It's just that you know we needed a function that's able to sort of characterize those sort of interactions. Um, and and the slice here, uh, I just want to clarify, it's actually the uh, proton densities that become sort of uh, uh, overly localized, not the electron densities, if that makes sense. So um, this is a problem that we have specific to NEO only because this is something else that, uh, I, I mean, I don't, I think a lot of times um, uh, uh, people don't show sort of electron densities only because, uh, well, they're, they're quite uh, delocalized, but uh, relatively speaking, proton den protons are, are are quite localized to uh, to where they are. Um, just in some cases, they're more localized uh, than others. So, I, I hope that answers your question in, in terms of what causes neo hartree fock to over localize protein densities. It's just that we're lacking just sort of this this uh, EPC correlation. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so it, we we do have an, a second question here. Um, which is, uh, first, they, they say, thanks for the presentation. Um, and then they've asked, how does NEO compare to path integral based methods um, in terms of like, you know, for example, performance limitations, advantages, disadvantages, et cetera? Right. Um, yeah. So uh, so I, I think, you know, we, we all know the path integrals uh, based approaches is, is also another way to uh, 
do concerted effects of, of nuclear quantum effects and decalculations. Um, I don't know if we've really done uh, necessarily direct comparisons with some of these uh, uh, path integral approaches. However, I would say that NEO has been shown to include at least the most significant uh, 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 nuclear quantum effects uh, into some of these calculations. So um, I think I think really where NEO shines uh, is not, uh, I guess we're sort of working towards uh, more quantitative accuracy, but I guess where NEO shines is that it's, it's, it's highly computationally efficient compared to some of the, these path integral based approaches. And a lot of times these path integral approaches, well, very, very important, they require you to have some sort of pre-computed, I guess, a uh, uh, potential function, so so to speak. So with Neo, you don't need to have that. You don't need to have a you know a pre-computed potential. And it's generally a more uh, uh, I don't want to say user-friendly approach, but it's certainly a more uh, I guess uh, maybe computationally tractable and 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 possibly a more general approach. I, I would say. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um... We've also got uh, some feedback just, you know, passing along congratulations on great work and a great webinar. Um, so, yes. Um, Thank so, you. <laughs> um, and then uh, additionally, I guess, uh, if no one else has any questions, we've got another uh, minute or two, but I've I've got a question on, I think, slide 19. Yes. Yeah. 19. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, so there's a pretty big dependence here on... Um, as as you mentioned when we bumped into this slide, right? Um, there's a pretty big dependence depending on the initial configuration of uh, the the solvent molecules around uh, the the molecule that you're looking right. at. So how how do you, I guess, and maybe this is uh, me showing my lack of QMMM knowledge a little bit, but how, yeah. how do you account for that variation in terms of um, making sure that you have coverage of all of the potential results? Does that, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, so that, that's a that's an excellent point. So, um, so I, I agree. So this is not a rigorous uh, sampling over all the many, I, I guess, uh, uh, possible configurations for water. For that, you probably have to use more advanced sampling techniques. So this is just sort of three sort of random snapshots uh, in terms of a water around uh, around melnaldehyde. So um, these things are. Uh, it could be um, you could have very drastic, very drastically different results from from water from one configuration to another. But in order to really probe what the effect of solvent is on proton transfer, I agree, you would actually have to do much, much more intensive sampling than what I would have shown here. Um, but uh, the reason why I, I wanted to show this is because um, oftentimes what we do is is start at a uh, fixed geometry for melanaldehyde and simulate proton transfer in vacuum. So the idea is using that same geometry without doing sort of advanced sampling beforehand, just to see what the effect solely from having explicit waters around it. Um, but you're right. A more comprehensive study would require us to do more more sampling. So that's oh. something that's that's not shown here. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I just I, I was curious. So um, yeah, that's an excellent question. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't believe I see any additional questions in the chat. Um, if you do have additional questions, we're going to have a um, a posting on our. QCHEM forum, um, where you can ask any follow-up questions that you may not have had the chance to ask during the talk or that have occurred to you after the talk. Um, so we can answer those there. Um, and I think that we're just about out of time. Um, but thank you again so much for um, such an awesome webinar. Um, it was really awesome to see all of the, you know, uh, obviously I, I remember you giving a talk on the NeoPCM work that you did uh, when you were here last summer, um, but it's been really awesome to see the stuff that you've been working on since then as you've, you know, gone back and continued sort of chipping away at this. So. Um, it sounds like you've done some really awesome work and, uh, thank you again. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon, for, uh, for hosting today's talk and thank you everyone for attending and also you all your excellent questions. Yeah. All right. Thanks everyone. Um, take care and hope y'all have a good week. Bye.